How can we support neurodivergent students to thrive in a new school? That's what we're going to explore in this week's episode of Pookie Ponders. Let's dive straight in. Transitioning to a new school can be a challenging journey for any child, but it presents unique hurdles for our neurodivergent students. These children who bring their own incredible strengths and perspectives will often face difficulties adapting to new environments, understanding new sets of rules and meeting a variety of teacher expectations upon transition. So in this week's podcast, I've explored a range of skills and knowledge that we can support neurodivergent children to develop in order to increase the chance of a successful transition to a new school. Which you choose to focus on will depend on the particular child that you have in mind, but I hope there are some helpful starting points and practical ideas for you to take away today. So let's make a start by thinking about the importance of self-awareness and advocacy. Self-awareness and advocacy are vital skills for children, especially those with special educational needs of any kind. This involves understanding their own strengths, challenges and needs and being able to communicate them effectively. Encouraging self-reflection and self-advocacy can empower students to take an active role in their learning and their life. Ideas for putting this into practice include the use of reflection journals. You can encourage children to maintain a daily or weekly reflection journal. This can be done alone or alongside a supporting adult. Here they can write or draw or share via voice recording, whatever works for them, their experiences, feelings and thoughts on various aspects of school life. This kind of practice can foster self-awareness and emotional intelligence. We can use role-playing scenarios. We can create role-playing activities where children practice advocating for themselves in different scenarios, such as asking for help or expressing their needs in a classroom setting. Or we can set up feedback sessions. Regularly scheduled feedback sessions with teachers or parents and caregivers can give children insights into their behaviour and learning, promoting self-awareness and creating a supportive environment for self-advocacy. Next, let's think about school rules. So understanding and adhering to school rules can be particularly challenging for neurodivergent children due to differences in how they perceive and process information. In particular here, you might quite find a challenge with any school rule that doesn't make sense to them or isn't perceived as fair. It's crucial to communicate all school rules in a clear and accessible way, taking into account their child's unique needs. Additionally, acknowledging the difficulties they may face in adhering to rules that are designed primarily for neurotypical children is essential. We've got to be realistic about this. Flexibility, negotiation and self-advocacy become really key components in this context. We can make it work by providing clear, detailed rule explanations. So providing explicit and detailed explanations of the school rules to avoid any ambiguity. We're going to use simple language, visuals can help, and examples of the rules in practice to ensure that the rules are understood and understandable to our neurodivergent children. We can think about the establishment of consistent routines. So our neurodivergent children are often going to thrive with routine. So establishing consistent routines that are going to incorporate the rules can really help them to understand and remember what's expected. And we don't have to wait until they're in the new situation to do this. We can think ahead about what those routines might look like. We can practice them while we're still in the old environment potentially. Self-advocacy comes in here as well, so we can teach and encourage self-advocacy skills. We can help children understand that it's okay for them to express when a rule feels unrealistic or challenging to them and to seek support or accommodations. We'll need to think really carefully about how to ensure that that self-advocacy and that ask for support is well received in the new environment so the child is seen as being an advocate for themselves and someone who wants to thrive in the environment rather than a child who is being seen as difficult or defiant or non-compliant, which is a risk. Social stories and role playing can have a role here too. So using social stories and role playing to demonstrate rule following in various scenarios can give a useful guide for a child. This method is going to help the child to visualise and practice appropriate behaviours whilst they're in a safe setting and with safe people around them. 
The next skills that we might look to focus on to support our children as they transition to a new school are time management and organisation. So effective time management and organisation are absolutely crucial skills that are going to help children to balance their academic and their personal lives. These skills are going to be particularly challenging for some of our children with special educational needs and making tailored strategies for them to be able to engage well in day-to-day school life is going to be crucial. That move, particularly from primary to secondary, is a big one. There are lots of tasks to organise. There are lots of things to manage within our time. It's challenging for every child. It's particularly challenged if we have those additional hurdles of an ADHD or an autistic brain that might make this feel just that bit more challenging to compute, to manage, to engage with every day. So we need to work with the child to try to help them to cope and thrive here, plan ahead, develop these skills as best we can. So putting this into practice might look like personalised planners, encouraging the use of a planner that works for the child or some kind of agenda tailored to the child's need. These might include things like visual aids, stickers, colour coding, anything we can to make the planning feel more engaging. It may be that the school provides a particular planner, but it is really worth here thinking, what works for this child? Is there a planner? Is there an app? Is there something that can help them to organise their time in a way that works for them? We can teach children to use organisational tools. So using tools like folders, binders or going online using digital apps to keep their school materials and assignments in order can make a really big difference. The simple things, just being able to find our work when we need it, knowing where to go for it, knowing how to put our hands on it, is a really big thing and if we have a more chaotic mind and we don't have that structure then this can be especially challenging for us so actually teaching this stuff even if it seems really obvious folders color coding apps these can be our friends here we can think about the use of mini goals so guide our children in setting small achievable goals for their tasks. This is gonna help them to break down big projects into manageable steps that they might feel that they can actually achieve. This is a skill that can be learned ahead of transition to the next school to get them ready for taking on these bigger kinds of tasks. And finally, routine establishment can really help here, helping children to develop a consistent daily routine that's gonna balance schoolwork, the activities that they enjoy, and their relaxation time. Consistency can be really comforting, especially for children who struggle with change or who thrive on routine. So again, this can be developed well in advance of the move up to big school and can be practiced again and again ahead of that transition to try and settle into a good, safe, consistent routine that balances out those different elements that need to be present in our child's life as they move to this next stage in their educational journey. The next one, number four, is a super practical one um, about navigating the school. One of the fears that most children have when they're moving to a new environment is the fear of getting lost. This is a really big and very real fear for many of our children, not just our neurodivergent children. So navigating the school environment is daunting, especially for children with special educational needs, but actually for every child. It's important to provide our children with the tools, the strategies, and where possible, the practice to feel confident and secure in the surroundings of their new environment. So we can do this, put it into practice by doing a bit of a school map exploration. So actually using a school map, hopefully one presented in a way that feels accessible for the child and giving them support to understand how to use this map. But we can use that map to familiarise the child with the layout of the school. Ideally, stepping into the map within the school, looking around us and getting used to it. But if not, doing an offline version of that or a kind of hybrid version where we might have a map and a bit of a video of some of the important parts of the setting to try to increase that familiarity. Remembering all the time that our levels of fear will decrease as our levels of familiarity increase. So anything that we can do to address that balance is going to make a really big difference here. Even tiny things make a big difference. Other things we can do here to help with the navigation of the school have a buddy system that you implement. Pair children with a buddy who can help them to navigate the school. Okay, they might get lost together but at least they are lost together it feels a lot less scary to be lost with a friend than lost on your own Um, this can help particularly in the first few weeks or if there are any changes and do remember
remember this for any of your neurodivergent children if there are changes if there's a room change if there's something about the site that means that things need to be navigated differently these will be challenging times also for our neurodivergent children and that buddying may come in helpful again here practice visits absolutely crucial really really helpful if you can't do it in person being able to do it over facetime or having a video is a next best thing but arranging for practice visits at the school during quieter times at first if possible in order to try to reduce that overwhelm the first few visits and um, so children can explore and become a bit more comfortable with the environment at their own pace we can also think about landmark identification, teaching children to identify specific landmarks within the school to aid their navigation. So they've got particular places they can always go back to and then think about how do I get to the next place from here. So thinking what those landmarks might be, becoming really familiar with them, making those landmarks feel like safe bases for further exploration of the school. Think about sensory navigation guides. So for children who are sensitive to sensory inputs, providing guides or tips on areas of the school that might be overwhelming, such as the cafeteria or the gym. This is something where you're going to need to think ahead to do it really well and work with the school that the child is going to and helping to think with them about whether there are any journeys around the school, for example, where they might avoid certain hotspot areas that might make things feel particularly more challenging for them. Sometimes there's more than one way to get to places in particular if we're able to go outside where things can feel quieter, less echoey, less sensory overwhelm and give ourselves some fresh air. This can be a good opportunity to kind of reset a little bit as we transition between different parts in our day rather than have the sensory overwhelm kind of added and added and added to. So just thinking a little bit there really about the sensory journey as the child is moving around the school and whether there are adaptations we can make to where they go and how they get there in order to try to support their sensory needs rather than to challenge them further. And then finally in the section on navigation, what if I get lost? Getting lost is a when not an if. So plan ahead with children about what steps they can take if they get lost. This is a really big fear for many children and it's one that will likely be realised at some point. So having a plan for action is going to be deeply reassuring. This is when we do our if then planning. If I get lost, then what do I do? We need some actions here. Do I ask someone? Do I get out my map? What am I going to do to help me in that situation? And be sure to take this beyond the theoretical, make it practical, role play it. If the answer is, if I get lost, then I'm going to ask someone for help. Think about exactly what am I going to say? What's the phrase that's going to come from my mouth? Can I practice saying it in a role play scenario so I've got that nailed and I can do it when I need to? Okay, we're at five of six in terms of the skills and the knowledge that I think are going to really help here. Study skills comes next, number five. So developing effective study skills is going to be crucial for the academic success of a child as they move on through their academic career. For children, especially those with special educational needs, tailored strategies that cater to their learning styles are going to be really important. This is a huge topic with hundreds of ideas and many of you are going to be far more well-placed than me to teach about this. But a few perennial ideas that seem to go down really well include mind mapping techniques. Teaching children how to use mind maps to organise their thoughts and ideas visually can be especially helpful for our more visual creative learners getting all these many many brilliant ideas that some of our children have down onto the paper in some way so they can pick their way through them uh, can be super helpful. Um, use of flashcards, I've seen this done really effectively, so introducing the use of flashcards to aid memorisation and recall. This is going to be particularly effective for children who benefit from repetition uh, and routine and visual cues. Reading strategies, so teaching specific reading strategies such as skimming, scanning, summarising to enhance comprehension and information retention. These are skills that every child is going to really benefit from. But what we've got to remember is that for our neurodivergent children, we are kind of working at this lower baseline to start with. There's so many challenges in this new environment for us that actually anything we can do to boost any of these basic skills just gives us that little bit more of a chance to possibly thrive 
thrive and survive really well in this environment. So don't forget the basics here. Don't get lost in thinking, well, what if they can't organize themselves and forget about the fact that, well, that's fine, but maybe they're really well organized, but perhaps those basic skills of, of skimming and scanning and getting the most from the text that they're working from in their lesson isn't there. So we need to think about these things too. Um, this can often be actually tapping back into stuff that a child has done well, providing reassurance, reminding them of the different skills that they've developed in the past that they can use again here and about the different context in which those great skills they've developed can be used. Just reminding them can be helpful here too. Um, and then finally, breaking things down. So breaking big tasks down into achievable chunks and sections so that it's approached in a more manageable way rather than this overwhelming whole. So many children will get this kind of um, paralysis about starting a task that feels too big. We can all empathize with that, I'm sure. So learning to break it down into something manageable, something that I feel I can do, makes a really big difference here. There's loads of resources out here that can support with this, including one or two that I've created. Things like task planner tools, um, but you can create your own equally. Just looking to take a big task and make it into tiny little steps that the child feels that they can do. And then finally on our journey today, we're going to think about understanding teacher expectations. So for neurodivergent children, comprehending and meeting teacher expectations can be a little bit more challenging than for their neurotypical peers because of their differences in social understanding and perhaps the degree to which they feel able to be flexible. These children often benefit from explicit instructions and clear examples. So it's going to be crucial to highlight how expectations can vary across different contexts, so such as various different classroom settings or during different activities like break time versus lesson time. So how are we going to get this right? So let's provide some context specific expectation guides. Sure sounds fun. We're going to create visual guides perhaps um, or lists or videos but guides of some kind that works for this particular child that details the expectations for different contexts such as in the science lab or in the drama studio or on the playground. These should be specific using really concise concrete language and visuals where we can will often help to delineate exactly what is expected of the child in each setting. This is crucial because in big school, it tends to really vary and I might have just got it nailed. I know exactly what's expected of me when I'm in my English class and then I go to science and it's a whole new world. And nobody thought to tell me what this teacher expects of me. It's also possible that just different teachers have different expectations of the child. Sometimes the rules and the expectations are not consistent across the entire environment. Let's learn as much as we can about this, as much as we can about what the expectations for behavior, what the rules are, how we interact in the different contexts and settings within the school and share as much of that as we can in a simple, concrete, not too overwhelming way for the child so they feel prepared. What we're trying to avoid here is getting it wrong. We want the child to feel socially safe. They know what is expected of them, but we also don't want them to be fearful that they're going to break the rules inadvertently. And there are so many rules, some of them written, many of them unwritten. In particular, those unwritten rules, which may not be communicated to this child, need to become written rules so they can be communicated so the child has some chance of getting them right. What feels obvious to this neurotypical child over here may be completely unapparent to our neurodivergent child. We need to spell it out if we're going to have any hope of them succeeding here. Otherwise, we just put them at this really unfair disadvantage and then wham, they're in detention for breaking a rule they didn't even know existed. So let's get this right. Let's plan ahead. Give them the best possible chance. We can also give explicit instructions on social cues and norms. So providing direct teaching on social cues and norms related to teacher-student interactions. This might include understanding non-verbal cues, tone of voice and appropriate responses in various situations. So this sounds a little bit kind of 
I don't know, I always get a little bit anxious around the idea of like social training and there's lots of, of, of stuff there that, that has really bad history. But actually the things that we can teach children around like body language and understanding faces and the cues that other people can just naturally follow that might say, oh, this teacher's getting a little bit angry right now or this is how we're expected to respond in this situation. We put our hands up before we speak. Some of these sort of Things that feel obvious to everyone else might not be obvious to this child. And anything we can do to help them to understand really matters. And then this idea about appropriate responses. This is crucial. Please, 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 please help this child to build a toolbox of phrases they can use which are non-inflammatory to help them out of situations that might not be going exactly right. Give them phrases that they can use that feel comfortable for them for asking for help for addressing the fact that they don't understand something. What can happen and where it can go really wrong sometimes is that our neurodivergent children, we, um, will say what's in our head and there's not always a great filter there and we don't do this in order to offend or upset but sometimes what we say can be really blunt it can come across as rude and with the wrong person on the other end of that then this can quickly escalate and the child can be seen as being non-compliant defiant rude and bam we're in detention again and this does not help at all and it engenders fear and worry in the child and we can get into these anxiety cycles so so that's all doomy and gloomy, I'm sorry. But we can avoid this by planning ahead, by having a bank of statements, of phrases that are empowering and polite and seen by staff, by adults, as this child looking for help. Every adult in a school will, should, look to help a child who is keen to learn, keen to engage, wants to be there and is asking for help in an appropriate way. As adults, we want our children to thrive in school. And so if we can find the right way for this child to communicate that and build this bridge with the adults around them, then we help to create a situation where the child will receive the help that they need rather than another black mark in their book. We can use scenario based learning, so using specific scenarios to teach about expectations in different contexts. So, for instance, discussing what is expected during a group project versus individual work, or how behaviour should differ in a library versus on a sports field. So, work this through, role play it if you want to, um, and, and really think about it. Actually, working through those rules and thinking about them in different contexts, going through a typical school day, a typical week, and thinking thinking about the different expectations on us, the rules, the social rules and so on, that can really help. Peer support and buddy systems, again, can really help here. So pairing our neurodivergent children with understanding peers who might guide them and model appropriate behaviours in different school settings can really help. Having a friend who understands that we don't always understand exactly what's expected of us can be super helpful here. For what it's worth, I have friends like this that help me as an adult sometimes. Sometimes I, I get this wrong. Um, I, I try really hard and my kind of library of how to behave and what's appropriate is a lot greater. I have gathered many pieces of information here over the years, but sometimes in a new situation, I don't know. Um, and when you have someone by your side who knows that you struggle with this, who you've spoken to beforehand and said, I might get a bit puzzled here, can you help me? It can be really, really helpful. Sometimes neither of you know and you explore together and that's okay if it's a truly kind of new context, a novel context to you both. But having someone on your team who gets it, who you can ask the silly questions of and check in with can really, really help here. And then finally, again, social stories and role playing ever useful here, developing social stories that are going to illustrate various school scenarios, highlighting the teacher's expectations in each scenario. This was this whole section was about teacher expectations. So we're going to think about the teacher expectations in each scenario. We can combine that with some role playing should we want to to practice the scenarios in a controlled environment. OK, Whew. Gosh, a lot. So as we conclude today's episode of Pookie Ponders, just remember the journey of supporting neurodivergent children is rewarding 
as it is challenging. Each strategy we discussed today is a step towards creating a more inclusive, understanding and nurturing environment for these students. And these are steps that they are a bit more in control of because we're teaching these skills and this knowledge. So they take them with them rather than expecting the environment to change for them. Sure, in an ideal world, the child will step into the perfectly neurodivergent friendly school. But let's be realistic. This is not going to happen for all of our children. So what can we control with them, for them, ahead of this to give them the best possible chance to thrive? Your role, whether as a teacher, a parent, a caregiver, is pivotal in shaping your child's educational experiences and helping them to realise this full potential and hopefully have some fun along the way as well. As you move forward, carry these ideas and practices with you, apply them, adapt them and watch as they make a positive impact. Together we can ensure that every transition, every new school experience becomes an opportunity for growth and success for our neurodivergent children. I really hope there were some helpful ideas in here for you. If you liked what you heard today, please subscribe and share my work. You can support my work further by joining me over on Patreon, where you get early access to all my resources and the chance to influence what I work on next. Or you can invite me to speak at your next event or in your setting, either virtually or face to face. Thank you so much for listening and for everything that you're doing for the children and young people in your care. It really matters. This has been Pookie Ponders with me, Pookie Knightsmith. Until the next time, stay curious, stay compassionate and as always, keep pondering. Over and out. Mm-hmm.